be under attack. Uh, again, strikes reported across the country, explosions in all major cities in Ukraine. This Russian invasion has begun, according to Ukrainian authorities, calling it a full-scale invasion now underway. Um, and the Belarusian troops again joining them from the north, at least. Now, Russian President Vladimir Putin, however, announcing this military operation yesterday and warning other countries any attempt to interfere would lead to, quote, consequences they've never seen, close quote. Putin argued this attack is aimed at protecting civilians in eastern Ukraine. Now, as he maintains his harsh rhetoric towards Kiev authorities, here's more from the Russian leader. I have made the decision of a military operation. Dear comrades, your fathers, grandfathers, and great-grandfathers did not fight defending our motherland for today's neo-Nazis to seize power in Ukraine. You took an oath of allegiance to the Ukrainian people and not to the anti-people junta that robs and harasses its own people. Don't follow its criminal orders. Whoever tries to interfere with us, and even more so to create threats for our country, our people should know that Russia's response will be immediate and will lead you to such consequences that you have never experienced in your history. On the Ukrainian side, President Zelensky held a phone call in the early morning with U.S. President Biden. Biden attempted to reassure his Ukrainian allies of some upcoming measures to contain and ostensibly punish Russia with efforts to ramp up at the United Nations. But in Kiev and under fire, President Zelensky again spoke to his embattled nation as they braced themselves under this Russian offensive. Here's the latest from the president. We know for sure that we don't need the war. Not a cold war, not a hot war, not a hybrid one. But if we'll be attacked by the enemy troops, if they try to take our country away from us, our freedom, our lives, the lives of our children, we will defend ourselves. Not attack, but defend ourselves. And when you'll be attacking us, you will see our faces, not our backs, but our faces. The war is a big disaster. And this disaster has a high price, with every meaning of this word. People lose money, reputation, quality of life, they lose freedom. But the main thing is that people lose their loved ones, they lose themselves. They told you that Ukraine is posing a threat to Russia. It was not the case in the past, not in the present, it's not going to be in the future. You are demanding security guarantees from NATO, but we also demand security guarantees. Security for Ukraine from you, from Russia, and other guarantees of the Budapest Memorandum. But our main goal is peace in Ukraine and the safety of our people, Ukrainians. For that, we are ready to have talks with anybody, including you, in any format, on any platform. The war will deprive security guarantees from everybody. Nobody will have guarantees of security anymore. Who will suffer the most from it? The people. Who doesn't want it the most? The people. Who can stop it? The people. But are those people among you? I am sure. Now we go to our defense correspondent, Jonathan Reggett, who's on the ground here covering uh, some of the latest now. I believe you're at the Russian embassy in Tel Aviv here. Uh, Jonathan, what's happening there? Yes, so at uh, the Russian embassy, and uh, maybe, David, you can see right uh, behind me a small protest uh, uh, for the moment. This is right outside uh, the uh, uh, Russian embassy in uh, central Tel Aviv. This uh, uh, protest is expected to grow uh, larger in number uh, later in the day. And one of the protesters, uh, Mikhail Bagani, is here uh, joining us. Mikhail, thank you for uh, joining us. I understand you, you arrived to Israel from Ukraine a few years ago, actually from the area of Donetsk, which was under partial uh, Russian occupation already. Uh, what are you feeling there this morning? Uh, this morning, this morning, I read the news, and uh, I thought that I cannot be silent anymore because um, I saw that this uh, Russian Russian Federation, this fascist Putin's regime, they started the the complex war in the, in Ukraine. They started with shellings, with bombings, and um, I think that international community is doing not enough. We're doing not enough pressure on Russia. We need to stop this fascist regime because uh, all they're doing is is. Neocolonial, neocolonialism, and uh, they're just trying to destroy Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian state, the independent, the sovereign state of Ukraine. They're trying to destroy it. They're trying to destroy, destroy Ukrainian culture. And uh, uh, I, think, I think we need to, to talk louder about, about it. Have you been able to contact uh, relatives in, in Ukraine to hear what is, what's the situation there? I contacted with my friends uh, in Ukraine in uh, not controlled um, in areas not controlled by Russian uh, supported troops, and um, they, uh, they worry about what's, what's happening, but they, they are calm. They're standing and um, they're ready to protect their houses, protect their families. And I want Russian soldiers to know that no Ukrainians are want to, to war with the Russia, but your government started the war against Ukraine. And uh, 
You need to know that uh, Ukrainians will protect their houses, their families, their children, and uh, they will never surrender. What can we expect here today? A small protest now? Are we expecting more people? I hope so. I really hope so. That uh, I, I saw a lot of Israelis uh, that were passing by in their cars. They were um, sending us some signals of support. And uh, sorry. And uh, uh, I believe that this protest will grow. That people will see that we are here. We are standing with Ukraine. We need to put pressure on Russian government, but we need to move only with legal uh, movements. We need to uh, make only legal uh, government on this. On this criminal regime. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Obviously, we see that you're very touched by this. Thank you very much uh, for being with us. These are the voices uh, uh, you hear them, David, here outside the Russian embassy. As far as Israel is concerned, another call this morning, both by a foreign uh, minister, Yari Lapid, and the Israeli ambassador in Ukraine, calling on all Israelis there, about 8,000 or so, to leave as soon as possible. Leaving from the air at the moment is, is no longer uh, uh, possible. Therefore, the embassy itself was moved from the city of Kiev, the capital, in the center of the country, to the city of Lvov uh, in western Ukraine, very close to the Polish border. And the call is uh, on, on all Israelis uh, to get there as much as possible to uh, leave Ukraine through land crossings, uh, mostly to uh, uh, Poland. The Romanian border is also not uh, very far. This is the call uh, this morning coming uh, from Israel. And the voices here, you've heard, uh, uh, quite uh, surprised and shocked by uh, the events of uh, the past few hours. John Larega, thanks for the updates. And of course, for bringing us that uh, palpably emotional uh, testimony from uh, one of the Ukrainian protesters there outside the embassy. We'll come back to you in a bit later on. Again, uh, some people starting to come out to protest in front of the Russian embassy in Tel Aviv now. But on the military side, some updates coming out of Ukraine. Again, live images from Kiev on your screen here now. The reports as of this morning indicating perhaps hundreds of Ukrainian servicemen already killed in the initial Russian onslaught. Now, airstrikes, rocket barrages, being reported across the country from the port of Odessa to Kiev International Airport. Now, uh, stories of, or at least reports emerging again of uh, Russian missile strikes taking place, airstrikes. The Ukrainians saying that they've downed some Russian warplanes and helicopters. The Russian Defense Ministry claiming that they've neutralized, as they put it, the Ukrainian air defenses. This being footage that just emerged in the moments as we were speaking here. This is a, allegedly a missile that struck the airport again in Ukraine. This is in Kiev. Again, uh, reports of a Russian airborne assault on the airports and the, and the seaports themselves coming in from virtually all directions in Ukraine. Belarusian armored columns also joining the Russians from the north, rolling down the major highway towards Kiev. People taking shelter, air raid sirens again. Some reports even of people fleeing the major cities, which are clearly a target at this point. For what appears to be an all-out assault on Ukraine, and that according to the Ukrainian government themselves. So these are the updates here. We'll continue rolling with them as they emerge here. So much happening in this arena. We're in the studio there with our correspondents. And Owen Alterman, a senior international affairs correspondent. Owen, the Israeli angle, one we keep trying to come back to and focus on here. The dilemma uh, between Russia, Ukraine, and the United States for Israel now. Uh, what's some of the latest emerging from the government? Yeah, I, I think the dilemma, frankly, David, is on hold for the moment. There's a much more pressing issue, and that's the Israelis who are in Ukraine. Uh, as I've said before in our broadcast, and Jews for that matter who are in Ukraine, as I said in our broadcast before, this is a more central issue for Israel than for other countries, right? I report in the British media that there were 5,000 British nationals on the eve of the war uh, in Ukraine in a country that's seven times the size of Israel. Israel, on the other hand, on the eve of the war, 10 to 15,000 Israelis, two to three times the number in a country that's, that is, is one-seventh of the size of Britain, and then beyond that, 150,000 to 200,000 Jews living in the country for whom Israel feels a, sen a sense of responsibility. In the last few moments, another statement issued by Israel's foreign ministry going exactly at that, providing practical advice for Israelis inside Ukraine on what to do, telling people, as Jonathan Regev mentioned, to get to land crossing, saying that Israeli embassies in neighboring countries have put representatives on the other sides of those borders. So if you get to the Polish border, there's an Israeli representative from the Israeli embassy in Poland on that border. Same in Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, and later in the day on the border with Moldova. So again, the Israeli government trying to take care of those Israelis in the country, telling them to get to those crossing points, putting out phone numbers and email addresses of the embassy, of the situation room in the, in the foreign ministry, for Israelis to register, to be in touch, and for the government to try to track them and help them and do what it can. Um, so obviously a fluid situation. I can say, I, one wonders, again, it, it's hard to, to level any kind of criticism at people under such a difficult situation, but I do know Romania well. I lived there for two years. There isn't just one major crossing point from Ukraine to Romania. There are two. There's also a third one, should say, which in fairness is a much more minor crossing. Why, assuming that both crossing points are open, why are there not representatives at both so that people can get to the one that's closest to where they live and to try to give people every avenue and every route to leave the country? But Israel, as we know, David, Israeli diplomats are known for going beyond what diplomats from other countries, what they do to help nationals, Israeli nationals who are abroad. That's going to be even more true in this situation, let alone what's going to happen with the much larger Jewish community in Ukraine. It's going to be a major, major focus for Israeli policymakers in the coming hours. Yeah, great for the update there. <clears throat> the Israeli government appearing to do 
what they can in this moment. So much developing on the ground right now. And the images on your screen, again, these are all coming out of Ukraine in the last minutes virtually here. Large explosions taking place across much of the country here. Again, that's what's on your screen here. But again, the Russians, at least their president, Vladimir Putin, justifying this all-out assault on the country, as he put it, to remove the neo-Nazis, quote-unquote, in Kiev now, as he refers to the central government of Ukraine. And he's claimed this is a peacekeeping mission, as his rhetoric has indicated there, all aimed at protecting civilians, as he puts it, in eastern Ukraine. Again, the only damage and uh, explosions we're seeing here are coming from elsewhere in the country. But here's more from Vladimir Putin. I have made the decision of a military operation. Dear comrades, your fathers, grandfathers and great-grandfathers did not fight defending our motherland for today's neo-Nazis to seize power in Ukraine. You took an oath of allegiance to the Ukrainian people and not to the anti-people junta that robs and harasses its own people. Don't follow its criminal orders. Whoever tries to interfere with us, and even more so to create threats for our country, our people should know that Russia's response will be immediate and will lead you to such consequences that you have never experienced in your history. Again, you are, if you're just joining us now, this is live breaking news coverage ongoing here at I-24 News. We're continuing to cover the latest now, everything developing quickly on the ground in Ukraine. And for a bit more on the military anal uh, analysis, now we're joined by security analyst Rafael Shami. Uh, thanks for being with us in the studio here. What the latest? Uh, the big picture taking place, latest reports, clearly a lot happening. What's it all look like to you? It appears to be the, the Russian objective at this point. The, the last minute uh, information is a uh, terrestrial entry from Crimea, Crimea. And we have the terrestrial entry from Belarus towards Kiev. So this indicates very clearly that we are in the worst scenario possible, meaning uh, a full-fledged uh, invasion of uh, Ukraine by Russia. Uh, this During the night, the missiles we were aimed at uh, strategic uh, points, uh, mostly uh, airports and air defense. And now that the artillery and the air force have done their job, the terrestrial entry is coming in. We are probably trying to uh, uh, see a blitz, meaning a very fast uh, in entrance in many different points into Ukraine uh, and uh, neutralizing of the Ukrainian military uh, defense uh, in a very fast, very well planned uh, uh, action. Uh, the the in Russian intel must be quite good because they know exactly where they're going and they know exactly how to neutralize on the way uh, air defense uh, facilities, uh, even civilian facilities have been hit. Uh, simultaneously, there is a cyber attack all over uh, Ukraine, uh, uh, hitting all the most strategic uh, uh, infrastructures. So this is the worst case scenario. We are going to have to see now uh, what is happening on the other side, because obviously the dissuasion of sanctions doesn't work. Uh, Putin is not impressed. Uh, the whole world is now going into a economic chaos. Uh, I mean, the boomerang of the sanctions will be actually very fast in, in coming. Uh, the Russians are counting on the help of the Chinese. Uh, anecdotically, uh, the Chinese have told their, their uh, uh, citizens in Ukraine to drive around with a little Chinese flag on their car, <laughs> meaning they will not be hit because they are the friendly force. Uh, that's the anecdote. Uh, the other anecdote that's less uh, uh, ironical is that there are um, uh, many cities, mayors have asked people uh, to stay home and others have asked people to evacuate the city. Uh, remember that in the Ukraine they do not have the shelters like we have in Israel or the training of the people, population to, you know, defend themselves. And that's the next problem that the Europeans are going to face because right now NATO is being tested. Right, and NATO is being, uh, uh, as usual when it's tested, uh, very disappointing. They're not doing anything. Uh, I'm not sure they're going to do anything, but the next crisis is going to be most probably the refugee crisis. Uh, tens of thousands of refugees fleeing westward. The question will be now, what will Europe do? Will it, as usual, close its borders? Will the Moldavians, will the Romanians, you know, let, let people go, uh, come out? Uh, that's why the Israelis already talked with the Russians in case if we cannot evacuate Israeli citizens and Jews towards the West, we evacuate them through Russia. This is going to be a huge humanitarian catastrophe as well. The last question, how long will the Ukrainian army, which is weakest than the Russian army for sure, how long will they last? How long before military victory of the Russians? The flag will be put up on uh, Kiev. But then the second question is, how long will be the civilian resistance, the resilience of the Ukrainian people? Once the army is defeated, it doesn't mean the Russians have completely won the, 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 the war. Uh, there might be a strong, strong resistance uh, of the Ukrainians, in which case we can in enter another scenario, which will be like an Afghanistan or Vietnam scenario, where the Russians are making what some um, many armies have done in the past, the mistake of confronting guerrilla warfare, urban guerrilla warfare.
There's so much happening as you highlight here, Rafael Rushami. Thanks for the updates there. Clearly, a lot taking place in this arena now. This is developing by the minute across Ukraine here. This is, again, as you just have it here, it appears to be an all out assault. You're watching images on your screen here. Some of the footage emerging here. We know that this has been a massive air in now, land assaults on the country from almost all directions here. Now, the Russians moving in, the Belarusians joining them from the north here. And we go back to Kiev at this moment to Oleg Golubenko, political analyst there in Kiev. Oleg, we spoke last hour. It appears more has taken place since that time. What else can you tell us about what you're hearing from the front lines of your country? First of all, we have officially martial law now in our country. So, and uh, we are ready to protect our territory, to defend. And uh, of course, uh, now we are uh, trying uh, to, to to receive all possible support from, from the world. Uh, so to organize an anti putler uh, coalition, uh, because only together we could stop uh, this mad guy. Because it's it's a really awful thing, uh, un- unbelievable. Uh, uh, till now, it's it's unbelievable because uh, it was normal, normal peaceful uh, agreements all the time. But Russia denied Ukrainians as nation. Uh, Putin crazy. He's crazy absolutely. And uh, it's it's we have a mad neighbor. This is a problem. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, we haven't enough maybe shelters. We haven't enough uh, weapon. But we have a spirit, to, uh, and uh, uh, we are ready uh, to protect uh, our territory, to defend our people, our families, and of course, uh, so each person in our country is ready, absolutely, to kill all uh, occupants, all the soldiers uh, who will come here. And you should understand one thing: that it's it's not a normal war. We are a very large country. We have more than 40 million people. And so our people uh, would like to be free and uh, to choose uh, democracy values. And of course, we will we will be strong and we hope for the whole world to be with us and so to protect uh, our ideas, our values. Uh, because it, it it's not normal war. It, it, it will be started the, the Third World War. Absolutely. It's the same ideas like Hitler has. Absolutely. But uh, only now uh, Ukrainians suffer from it because of the ideas of one crazy guy in Kremlin that uh, it shouldn't be existing. Absolutely. Like country, like nation, like people. Oleg, thanks for those updates. Stay with us. We are uh, moving back to the studio again just to tell anyone tuning in here. We're watching the unfolding situation here and trying to cover everything as it emerges from Ukraine. There's been uh, reports emerging from virtually every city now, of massive explosions across Ukraine, the main cities all being targeted, the airports, the seaports, certainly all the uh, military installations for the Ukrainian defense forces. We have a correspondent here in the studio, Ariel Saran. Ariel, what, uh, what's some of the latest has been obviously uh, so much going on. What can you tell us about what appears to be happening on these front lines with the Russian troop movements? What's the latest? Well, pretty much we're seeing all of Ukraine one front line, whether it's border cities, cities inside. If we're talking about uh, the north, we saw earlier this morning uh, ground tanks, troops entering pretty much uh, undist- without any disturbance from the Belarusian border. The Russians were uh, not only what appears they were doing drills, combined drills with the Russian and Belarusian forces, but this was apparently preparation, not just a, a drill, but preparation for this ground invasion. And what's interesting about this entry point from the north, that's the fastest way to get to the capital, Kiev. And I think what we're seeing now is a, a, a ground race to Kiev. And one of the main uh, missions of the Ukrainian army is to try and stop uh, Russian forces from getting into Kiev. We're also hearing air sirens, air raid sirens in the capital, Kiev, and Lviv in the in the west. Yeah. They've been going off pretty much Ariel, just to nonstop. Just explain what our viewers are looking at here. These are uh, purported to be uh, images of Russian troops now already moving into the second largest city in the country, Kharkov, out in the east part of the country here. This is, again, all indicating the Russian ground troops on the move, as, as you report. Yeah, second largest city, and it was actually the first capital of the Ukrainian Federation which when the capital moved to uh, Kiev in 1934. So this is in the northeastern part of, of Ukraine near uh, the Donbass area. It's Kharkiv is right near the Russian border city of uh, Belgorod. And so we're seeing already for, uh, ground forces in the northeast, ground forces coming in from Belarus, Be- Belarusia in the north. Also from the south, there's images of uh, Russian forces coming in from Crimea. We're also seeing uh, reports off the port of the port city of Odessa, the country's third largest city of Navy vessels on fire. In uh, elsewhere in the east, we throughout the night there were rocket barrages in the regions of Donetsk, Lugansk, and as well as currently this morning, we're seeing Russian air force acting in the Donbas. In the west, there were the air raid uh, sirens in Lvov, and also the airport or the airfield of Frankivsk in the west was uh, struck too. So all across the country, city of Uman also inside, every major city in the country has appeared to become 
under fire. Ukraine is one big front line at the moment. It's uh, uh, somewhat staggering here as we uh, clearly cannot keep up with everything taking place, likely neither can the Ukrainians. Uh, attacks taking place in every corner of their large country here, from the sea, from the land, from the air. It appears to be as we've, uh, our correspondents have been covering here, an all-out assault on the government in Kiev. Now we'll Developments happening rapidly on the ground, taking place rapidly now. This is, appears to be the goal. Again, we're covering it based on all the latest reports here, the explosions being reported, the footage emerging. The Ukrainian Defense Ministry saying that they've been uh, taking out Russian warplanes from the sky. The Russians, for their part, saying that they've neutralized the Ukrainian air defenses. Uh, and so much happening on the international arena. It's such a, an important factor at this point here. All eyes looking certainly to the west. But uh, we have Owen Alterman in the studio here still. Uh, Owen, what's the latest? Yeah, a couple quick updates from here in Israel, David. We were told earlier this morning by the foreign ministry that the foreign minister, Yair Lapid, would hold a situational assessment. That's maybe the best translation from the Hebrew at 10 o'clock local time, so in a half an hour, assuming that's still on. We've also heard that the foreign minister, this is not uninteresting. We'll be giving a press conference at 12 o'clock local time on the situation in Ukraine. Two and a half hours from when you're nodding because it, it promises yeah. to be a very interesting press conference, especially if there are questions from reporters, yeah. because he will not be able to, to, to evade, uh, at least not the question, and may by his answer be able to be evasive about Israel's position on the conflict and on the war. As we all know, Israel has been very, very careful in terms of what it said, waited until yesterday to put out even a very carefully worded statement, as I often compared on our air, like a page of Talmud where you have the text in the middle, and need the commentary all around it to decipher what it means. Uh, that was put out to try to to strike the Israeli balance between its alliance with the United States, the need for ties with Russia, given the Russian presence in Syria. So Lapid may not be able to escape taking some position on that. Of course, what's front and center for Israeli policymakers is a legitimate issue in its own right are the Israeli nationals and the Jews inside the country, as I said earlier, larger number per capita in Israel than elsewhere. Specific instructions from the foreign ministry to Israelis to get to border crossings in the West, Israeli embassies in those countries in Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, later in the day in Moldova, in Moldova putting representatives on the other side of those border crossings to absorb the Israelis, giving practical information to Israelis inside the country about what to do. And uh, when you, you bring up this uh, working relationship with Russia that's been so critical for Israel, we've seen that allegedly on display again overnight here, Syrian media reporting overnight as this Russian assault was taking place on Ukraine, that alleged Israeli strike took place outside Damascus. Again, this is Russia's backyard militarily here. The Russian military is so... Uh, and Israel's backyard dominant. geographically. Yes, yes, and so clearly that, that aspect of the relationship between Israel and Russia as relevant as ever, and perhaps more sensitive than ever. We've seen some ups and downs. An understatement. That. Uh, so that likely to be a, a heavy topic or a hot topic at this press conference in about 30 minutes here with the foreign ministry. Uh, yeah. Two and a half hours. 12 two o'clock. The situational hours. assessment at 10 o'clock this we'll morning. Keep it, we'll keep our viewers involved with all of that now. So this is, again, you're seeing some of the alleged images that emerged. Three soldiers killed, according to Syrian uh, state media there, in this alleged Israeli strike. Again, overnight, near Damascus, an area where the skies are virtually controlled by the Russians. It appears Ukraine is also now an area where the Russians are controlling the skies here. We know that there's been now, no civilian traffic in the air over Ukraine here. The reports of airstrikes ongoing. Now, a land incursion as well coming in from Crimea, coming in from the north in Belarus, and of course the east, where troops have been amassing for weeks and weeks. And uh, we have uh, the New York Times uh, Moscow correspondent, Ivan uh, Ivan Nechaparenko. Thanks for joining us here, uh, Ivan. So much happening right now. What's being said inside Russia about the nature of these moves against what Vladimir Putin calls neo Nazis in Kiev? Well, I think most Russians uh, woke up in shock today because uh, despite all the earlier reports about that happening, I think most people, even those who are critical of President Vladimir Putin, have been very skeptical. They wouldn't believe that uh, Russia would wage a war against uh, uh, what many Russians believe is a brotherly nation. Uh, so I think there's a lot of shock. And um, uh, basically, people think about what Russia will be like as a country after this happens, because it's not just a war in Ukraine, but clearly that uh, this, this will be continued with some measures inside the country too, because many people are already calling for protests, and many people are saying that this is the most shameful uh, event of their lives. The dramatic uh, sentiments coming out of Russia here. We know Vladimir Putin in power for some 22 years. It appears he's had virtually no domestic public constraints on the behavior of his military or his, his orders for it now. Does that equation in place, or is there a risk of popular protests in Red Square? Well, I think uh, what they saw from President Vladimir Putin's meeting with his uh, top security officials is that uh, even his top security lieutenants were not quite sure that the decision he made is the right course of action. So I, I would expect that the main point of contention to be among the elites, because uh, now is the point where uh, all people... Okay, so uh, I think for many members of the elite, the so-called technocrats, the liberals, uh, this will be a very, very difficult choice. So I would expect some uh, tensions there. 
It, Ivan, are you getting different reports inside Russia than what we're seeing about essentially an all-out assault from almost every direction on Ukraine right now? Troops coming out of Crimea, coming out of Belarus, coming out of the east. Does it appear to be an all-out assault on a regime change operation for Ukraine? Well, the Russian defense ministry just issued a statement saying that they have suppressed the Ukrainian air defense missiles and that they have rendered all Ukrainian uh, military airfields uh, inoperable. So that means that uh, they have launched an all-out assault on the whole country uh, because Ukraine has airfields all across the country. So uh, that basically confirms that, yes. Ivan, thanks for the reports here. Again, coming out of Russia, we do uh, have some updates. Ukrainian authorities saying that seven, at least seven people have been killed. We, again, we don't know the nature of exactly where or what, but uh, so much footage of these missile strikes. You just saw one of them on your screen there. Clearly, casualties are taking place across Ukraine. Uh, we go back to Kiev now where Oleg Golovenko joining us now. Oleg, some confirmation from your government now of people being killed in this conflict. What's the nature of it and how many? We don't know exactly there are, because there are a lot of fake news, especially came from Russia. We know that uh, they used uh, like uh, propaganda like Hitler used before. Uh, it's absolutely the same. And they're telling a lot of uh, fake things. And so and uh, we, we, we should hear only officials, our officials. And uh, of course, uh, because uh, the main idea of Russia is to organize panic here. And uh, of course, they, they could provide different fake news and they made it a lot of them. Uh, because of propaganda but really so i don't know exactly what, what happened because uh, it's uh, it's only you know, so each uh, half an hour we have uh, break news uh, officials and uh, so we are trying to to, to protect and uh, to change a lot and uh, i don't know a lot uh, and uh, of course it, it's now it, it's difficult uh, difficult because we don't know exactly what to do because uh, we really we were not expected like something like this uh, like such attack and um, so i hope that we have enough time to prepare because our army is defending now, and uh, sometimes we could uh, hear even these explosions. Explosions uh, of them. It's uh, working of uh, our uh, anti-plane system, and uh, so it was reported uh, a lot of uh, planes, Russian planes were uh, were shot, and so uh, and the helicopter. So and uh, really, I try to believe to to our officials, not to Russian propaganda, because and that's why I don't know exactly what what we have. And so and this is a situation. It's rather difficult for us. Yes, you talk about this misinformation campaign. There's reports of a cyber assault on the country as well. Are you seeing signs of that, or and Oleg? on top of that is the rhetoric is the discussion changing among you and your neighbors here is there a calculation in place about whether to stay whether to go we understand there's been some conflicting policies across the country from even the mayors uh, some places being told to stay some places told to evacuate yeah so we were not ready really this is a problem because um, so it, it we are not prepared so for example uh, israel uh, so uh, is uh, in the war for for a long year good term yeah so we are not accustomed for such uh, uh, yet for for such mad neighbor so uh, we will be stronger of course and i really believe in our army and in our people and so, and we are ready to protect. And so, to tell the truth, we don't know what to do, really. A lot of us don't know what to do. Me, personally, I know what to do, and so I will be uh, protect and defense, uh, and so, of course. And uh, so, I hope that uh, we will receive uh, normal instructions uh, what, what to do and what, uh, what what should we do. Now, uh, the main activity is, our, is from our army. This is uh, the main idea uh, for us, because they are professionals. They, want, uh, they know what to do. We have a lot of soldiers. We have a lot of people with... Uh, war experience and uh, so i hope that uh, with the help of all the world uh, we will stop uh, this uh, uh, fascist uh, regime of putin and lukashenko Oleg Golubenko again in kiev thanks for being with us on the latest there we are still with ivan nechbrenko from the new york times in russia uh, you mentioned uh, some of the shock this morning ivan as people woke up to this news what exactly is being fed to the people of russia right now is it all state media or they have access to foreign media outlets in terms of where they're getting their updates and, and what what is the news there well, of course, the state media is portraying it as not as a war, but as a military operation against, uh, as you said, I think, Nazis uh, in Ukraine. Uh, they Vladimir Putin's words, yes. They, yes, and they broadcast, this is what I was about to say, that they just broadcast his statement over and over again. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you look at, uh, outside this state-run bubble, if you look at social networks, of course, people say and, and uh, report different things. Uh, many people in Russia have relatives in Ukraine. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, I myself is half Ukrainian, half Russian. Um, so I have relatives and friends there. So uh, uh, for many people, it's a personal matter, really. And they can they can get reports from the other side of what is happening there. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a difficult situation for the country. Ivan, thank you again for the updates coming to us from Russia. Now, just to recap a bit now, if I can, for our viewers who may thank be you. tuning in again. Yes, thank you, Ivan. That's a break coming to us from Russia there. This is all how the world woke up today to see the assault begin on Ukraine here. Vladimir Putin declaring the beginning of what he termed a special military operation. Now there are casualties being reported. The European Union making a statement. Let's listen in. 
President of the European Council, President Michel, has called for a meeting of the European Council this evening, and they will agree and provide political guidance to adopt the stronger package, the harshest package of sanctions we have ever implemented. As High Representative for the Foreign Affairs and Security Policy of the European Union, I will be in touch with our partners around the world to ensure the international community will be fully grasping the gravity of the moment and to call strongly and united on Russia to seize immediately this behavior, intolerable behavior, and Russian leadership will face unprecedented isolation. This is not a question of blocks. This is not a question of diplomatic power games. It's a matter of life and death. It's about the future of our global community. And we will stand united with our transatlantic partners and with all European nations in defending this position. We stand united in saying that no violence and destruction as means to obtain political gains. We, the European Union, remain the stronger group of nations in the world and this should not be underestimated. More immediately, we will be designing urgent assistance to Ukraine in this dire situation. We will also be active in supporting evacuation operations, including of our own staff in zones affected by this Russian attack. The European Union, together with the transatlantic and like-minded partners, have made unprecedented efforts to achieve a diplomatic solution to the security crisis caused by Russia. But Russia has not reciprocated these efforts and instead has opted unilaterally for a grave and premeditated escalation conducting to war. President Putin needs to stop this senseless aggression. And today our thoughts are with the people of Ukraine. We will stand with them. Again, you're watching statements from the European Union here again as they stake out their position again. No change really trying to dissuade uh, President Putin with their harsh rhetoric now from the ongoing, as far as we can tell from reports, full assault from all directions almost on Ukraine here now. The ports, the airports and seaports under attack. Uh, we are in the studio still looking at the uh, situation at large, certainly as the Israeli government may be involved here. Uh, actually, we'll be back with much more. We're stepping out for some break here. We'll keep, continue our live coverage there. This is a, a fluid situation. We're also trying to keep up with like the rest of the world here. War underway in Ukraine, the Russian assault. As the Ukrainian government puts it, full-scale invasion underway. Reports indicate Russian troops crossing the borders from Crimea, from the east and from the north alongside the Belarusians. We'll keep you updated for now on the breaking war in Ukraine here for My24 News.